What can a silver coin purse and a cigarette card tell us about the Ottoman Empire? Stick with us to find out more on Artifactually Speaking. Hello and welcome to Artifactually Speaking. I'm Brad Hafford, archaeologist and specialist in the ancient world. And I'm Tom Petrick, historian of modern Europe. It's time once again, Tom, to look at two more artifacts. Objects that are modified or used by humans are artifacts, even though we tend to use the word typically for really ancient stuff. But what we're doing is looking at more modern things and trying to use them as a focal point in history. Collectors, of course, are interested in the history of their objects, but dealers uh, of antiques are usually more interested in monetary value. But it fluctuates. Right now, what they call brown furniture is not really valuable because it's not in vogue. But historical value remains in an object. It's always a useful exercise, I think, to think about what does this thing mean? Who might have carried it uh, or used it or made it? And that's why we are doing exactly that. We're asking questions of an object. These sorts of things will always be in vogue to us. We're looking at things that are actually not terribly valuable monetarily, but rather, if we just ask these simple questions, we find out they're very complicated answers, and often many answers to each one of these questions. So in that respect, we are acting like journalists. And in this case, we are trying to find out something about the Ottoman Empire. It's a good six centuries work, worth of uh, material. It is. So I could start at the beginning and look up Osman I, I think 1299 or so. This is a long time ago. But if you try to do that, sometimes you just lose that thread and maybe it becomes more of a chore. So in this case, we're looking really at very near the end of the Ottoman Empire in a period that has often been called its decline. The 19th century was a time of great turmoil and it's a bit cliche to say, but contradiction within the empire as it's dealing with nationalities and declining influence. We're not just going to look at the Ottoman Empire either. We're going to look at the perception of the Ottoman Empire in the West. I'm, I'm going to use this term a lot, West and East, even though I know that that's such a huge generalization right. and kind of based on colonial ideas. But I'm kind of going to use the East to mean the Ottomans in this case, even though that's not really true. But the Ottoman yeah. Empire was big in the East, right? The terms are so relative, but yet you can't help but use them. I guess so. There was a sort of difference in attitude, I suppose, in the Western world. Too often that term is used, though, to mean developed and sophisticated and good, and the others not developed and not good. That's not what we mean. Right, We're or just... a monolithic civilization that advanced from, as some people say, Plato to NATO. <laughs> right. <laughs> so neither the West nor the East is this monolithic thing. Of course, there's so many things in them that make them so complicated. Right, and uh, it's all about interaction. It is, and we're going to look into that and try to point out that complexity, but at times I'm afraid I am going to just say, in the West. And <laughs> right. I understand that that's not really a thing. Kind right, of and our case, we'll be using it as just a shorthand. Right. I want to jump right into that first object, our first artifact. And it is a coin purse. Why do I call it Ottoman? Well, first of all, I bought it in Istanbul, in the Grand Bazaar. And it is a type that was used in the East to carry coins. It is what's called a chain mesh purse with a gate top because it opens up. You can see how fantastically well engineered this thing is. It expands on all these pivot points and it can hold things inside it. Maybe not a whole lot of things, but it does expand enough to hold quite a bit. It's also made out of these metal links so that the old style of thief, uh, called a cut purse for a reason, they would um, sort of bump into you and cut your purse with a razor or something and be able to reach their hand in. Well, with the metal, you, you couldn't do that. And the gate top locks in, so it's sometimes called a miser's purse, probably because it, it kind of looks like you're sealing away your money. You, you don't want to give it out. 
But it is a really interesting form of coin purse. And it did become fashionable in the West as well. A little bit later, probably, this one, it dates somewhere between 1880 and 1910. And you see these kinds of mesh bags um, with fashionable ladies in the, say, 1920s. They would go out to a dance or something and have this very small mesh bag. The gate top, not quite as common as a more clasping chain mesh purse. So that's a bit of the first questions we normally ask. What? It's a coin purse. When? Eh, somewhere, let's say around 1890. And uh, where? Probably in Turkey and that sort of zone. But I kind of want to jump a little bit into some of the how, how it was carried. Here, I'm going to look at an image of some people in Turkey. These come from an area called Jarbakir, which is in the east of Turkey, sort of near the Syrian border. And I want to zoom in to this man on the right. Look at his belt and how complicated this is. It's very interesting, I think. You can tuck all sorts of things into the belt. And right up in here, we have a kind of purse. Now, it's not the chain mesh one that we're looking at, but it may very well have held his coins. And so this was fairly typical of people in this region, in what I'm using as the East, much of their clothing didn't really have pockets the way that many of the Western clothing did. So they would often wear these elaborate belts and they would put things into them, including perhaps a purse like this. So in this Eastern zone, it is usually associated with men, really. Whereas in the West, when these small purses were popular, they were tending to be associated with women. But, you know, the thing about that photograph that I showed, it is, it's kind of reality, but it's a staged photo. It was made, along with many others, into a book in 1873. And this is fairly early in the history of photography. And it was made for a World's Fair in Vienna in 1873. So it was the Ottoman Imperial Commission that was making this to try and show the variety of peoples across this Ottoman Empire. Right. One of the really interesting points about that is that the Ottoman Empire is such a multi-ethnic grouping of peoples. Arabs, Turks, Bulgarians, it's at a certain point, Albanians, and so on and so on. Yes. So to try to document all those different cultures is a fascinating uh, topic in and of itself. It is. And why not use this new thing of photography? Uh, to do that, and what better place to show it off than a World's Fair. It's also quite interesting to see, at the same time, some of the opinions and depictions of, I guess you call them Ottomans, in the European imagination. And that brings us to our next item. It does indeed. Here's our second artifact. So this is a cigarette card that was packaged by the WD and HO Wills Cigarette Company in 1906. Although technically at this point it would have been owned by Imperial Tobacco, it still says Wills on it. Mm -hmm. These were a kind of trading card, if you want to think about it that way. And this one in particular, it shows what they viewed as the typical Ottoman male. He's wearing a, a red fez, which is sometimes also called a, a tarbush. He looks like a, a wise, some sort of wise elder with a gray beard probably knows many, many things. There's an accompanying coin, which yeah. contains the, the yeah. Ottoman Sultan's official seal, which is very intricate and beautiful. And it has time, the time in Istanbul, which they've, they've labeled as Constantinople, and how it is relative to Greenwich Mean Time. They've got it at one hour and 56 minutes ahead of Greenwich. And that seems a little odd to me because when we think about how you set up time zones, it's usually an hour each, right? And here's right. 56 right. minutes. So this gets us to a, a bit of a phenomenon that lasted from the 1870s to the 1940s, what I'm calling trading cards. They came packed with cigarettes. Wills really revolutionized and pioneered this for Britain and its empire. WDHO Wills as a company had been founded in the late 18th century, but it was in the 1870s and 1880s. They started packing these things. They did a famous line with cricket players, which is kind of like baseball cards for us, right? Right. And the first 
baseball cards were really cigarette cards even in the U.S. Right. To promote brand loyalty, I guess. We don't know exactly where this one would have been printed and packed. Britain, possibly. British Empire, certainly. So why do you think they chose, though, to depict this Ottoman man on this particular card? There is a series of peoples of the world. And to us, it's kind of orientalizing. And at the time, it did teach about something like that. And they might have been interested for that reason. Yeah, well, that's why I wanted to look at the back, though, to see what they are saying. Well, they correctly point out that the Ottoman Empire was a a massive entity, very diverse. Um, It did have economic power, although it had a lot of economic problems as well. And interestingly enough, they note the size of the Turkish army. The First World War coming up, I don't know that they would know that in 1906, but... True, but they would certainly have known from the past that the Ottoman Empire and its its fate was certainly a, a British interest. They had fought on the same side uh, in the Crimean War. The Russian War with the Turks in 1877-1878 was a major British concern because it dealt with Black Sea access to the Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. So this was something they always had to keep in mind. And, of course, they have that image of the coin as well. Right, We're getting exactly. into a bit of the how on the card because it's printed in a four-color process, but then they also make an extra run of this silverish ink to make it look like a real coin. Right, and I think they've done a really nice job of that, and that's probably the coin that typical Ottoman citizen would have carried. Here's an example of a coin like that one. On the card, it is called a one Beishlik coin. So I kind of need the camera here again to show what that looks like. It shows that Ottoman Sultan's sigil, I guess you would call it, the Tukra, I think it's called. Um, but it says one Beishlik, and one Beishlik is five piasters. So the coin as an example I have is really a two piaster coin. And it uh, has that Tukra there. And on the other side, it tells us when and where it was struck. It says 1327. That is the Hijri date, so it's an Islamic uh, calendar. On the underlined on the right, that's the back of the coin. It says 1327. On the front, underneath the Tura, there's the number two. And that's because it's the second year of the reign of the Sultan, Mehmet the V. He took control in 1327, but this is the second year. 1327 converts to 1909 in the Common Era, so this coin dates to 1910. The coin on the card that you were talking about is presumably 1906, because that's when the card was manufactured. And so that would have been the Sultan beforehand. That would have been Abdul Hamid II, yeah. known in history as Abdul the Damned. Well, there was a lot of political problems within his reign, the empire was continuing to lose territory, there was a constitutional movement mm-hmm. in which liberal reformers enacted a constitution, but then he suspended it, so there was a lot of tension during his, his uh, tenure. The Ottoman Empire is contracting in many ways, losing territory. It's also interacting with the West in more ways. It's not even just the West, but all the great powers of Europe, including, of course, the Russian Empire, have some stake in, at the Ottoman Empire's, in the Ottoman Empire's decline, so much so that the Ottoman Empire was known as the sick man of Europe. It's declining, mm. and we all better get a piece while we can. Well, we're getting into uh, economics in many ways, something that I study a great deal, and the economic interaction between these great powers, of course, was quite important. So we've gotten to this big issue from a small one, but even the coin... That's an economic tool, right? Of course. And that example coin that we showed would possibly be carried in this purse, right? Absolutely. So I haven't shown it yet on my close-up camera, so I thought I would do that and show just how uh, interesting this gate top is. So you can see that the locking mechanism is actually broken off of this one. Um, It would have been inside so that when I closed it, I could turn the lid and it would seal in against the locking mechanism so that you wouldn't be able to open it. But once you did unlock it, you could spread it out on all of those pivot points. So it opens up and then you can, well, drop something right in so that you could carry 
coins, many coins in there. Now, I was talking about the how this was made and where it was made, and there are some hallmarks right here on this loop. That loop it was made to attach another chain, perhaps to wrap around your neck or into your belt. These hallmarks are pretending to be British. When you look at that far left mark, it is trying to be what's called a lion passant, the lion that is moving across. And then the next one is an anchor. The anchor should mean Birmingham, which is a place where, uh, in England, where silver was assayed and hallmarked. But then the next mark says 900. Well, first of all, those marks aren't really well made. They don't look all that English. And then the 900 says that that means it's 900 parts per thousand of silver. Well, the lion should mean sterling silver, which is 925 parts per thousand. So the British would never put a 900 on it. In fact, they are marks that make it seem more saleable, I think. The Swiss often did this for the Ottoman market. And you find this a lot on pocket watches, so a silver-cased pocket watch. The Swiss were really good at making watches. But with the silver case, well, this will make it a bit more saleable. So do you think the person who made this was a bit savvy and clever, but also unethical? Certainly, if this was found in England, they would not be happy. It would not be right. legal, and they would right. probably destroy it because they don't want their hallmarks used by anyone else. And in fact, the West, if we can call it that, was kind of manipulating the Ottomans at this point. It is that sick man of Europe. Meanwhile, I think in 1876, you had mentioned there's a constitution in Turkey. A, uh, the first constitutional movement was 1876. I think they had even started to remove some of these clothing restrictions because there were many laws, I think, about what you could and couldn't wear. That's true. In the 1820s, the Sultan had decreed that all males within the empire must wear the fez, uh, as shown yeah. on that uh, on that cigarette card. Right. Uh, they may have relaxed that in subsequent decades. I in think in the later court. 19th century, I think they did begin to do that and more started to wear more Western clothing, especially diplomats. As the restrictions started to be removed, I think it was because of this influence from the West. In fact, the people in Britain were depending on the things that they got in from the Ottoman Empire. And some of those are shown on your card. Tobacco, cereals, fruit, silk, and wool is what they list as the chief exports. In about 1876, the Ottoman Empire defaulted on some loans that came from uh, the West. So after that point, these Western powers began to impose monopolies on certain products. So they were manipulating the Ottomans to get better deals. Well, speaking of tobacco and those cards, I'd like to get actually to the other tobacco card we have. It's from the same series, right? Right, but this one says Palestine, and I just want to add a, a quick little disclaimer or asterisk here. The word Palestine itself is quite an ancient one. I know it goes back before the Roman Empire, but the Romans certainly knew that area as Palestine, and that also existed in the Ottoman Empire. So what we're saying here is that it's the region historically known as Palestine, right? <laughs> right. But right here at the top of the card, it says a country lying to the southwest of Syria and governed by Turkey. So at right. the time, it was under that control. Um, it becomes a British mandate in 1920. Right. And right. then becomes Israel in 1948, I believe. What uh, I find to be really striking about this is that the person depicted is not what we think of as a typical Arab-Palestinian woman. She looks a lot more like the folks on your photograph. It looks right. like more Ottoman dress or maybe even Albanian or something like that. It does. And I have this photo because the woman at the right in particular looks quite a bit like that. I mean, you can see that there are a lot of coins on her headdress and she's wearing them around her neck as well in long chains. And this was pretty common. Women would wear as decoration, things that were either real coins or ones that were made to look like coins. One of the reasons that I say, you know, mostly the coin purses were uh, for men. Women often wore a representation of their wealth as uh, jewelry. It's literally uh, quite brilliant. It must have really caught the eye at the time as well. I'm sure. You can't quite see it in a black and white photograph, but I'm, I'm sure it did. 
Well, those women in that photograph are actually labeled as coming from Syria, which was the, uh, one of the zones, and it's very close also to the zone that was labeled Palestine. So, yeah, people at this time probably did uh, look like that, but she's probably wearing her best gear. Her headdress there may not be everyday wear. Something very traditional for a special occasion. Mm -hmm. And one other thing to look at, first of all, the coin that's shown is, again, the one Beishlik value 10D. That would be uh, 10 pence, because this is a very, well, uh, Anglo-centric thing. They were issued by a British company to educate British people about other areas. But look at the time. It says in Jerusalem, the time at noon in England would have been two hours, 20 and three quarters minutes fast, so later. That is pretty precise when you get down to the three quarters of a minute. So that leaves us with one final question. The who question. Who would have had these? Who would have bought these? And it's really open to anybody who would have had access to these cigarettes on the market. If you bought them, you would have received a card. Therefore, it's probably something that, that happened within the British Empire. Well, a lot of people smoked in this time period. It's another one of those things that we run into a lot when we look at our modern artifacts, is that sometimes they're associated with things that we don't accept anymore. We know that smoking is not at all good for your health, and right. marketing of smoking was pretty heavy. So these cards, there were 50 in this uh, series, and most series had 50, and people might want to collect the whole thing. But who would be the most likely to want to collect them? Kids love having a collection and putting mm -hmm. it together and maybe even lining them up. And that way, kids would even learn something, learn something about the different peoples of the earth. Right. So do you think they were marketing to kids, trying to make them smoke? Try to encourage their parents to stick with this brand so yeah. I can get all these cards. Yeah. If the kids keep saying, oh, stick with this brand, I want the whole series. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I've even read about that some children would hang out in front of the tobacco store, and when somebody would come out, they'd say, hey, can we have your card? You know, and maybe whoever's <laughs> smoking it, like, yeah, I just want the cigarette, and they would give the card to the kid. That's certainly what I would imagine, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And with the coin purse, we've talked about the who a bit, you know, who's going to use it? Probably an Ottoman man, but there's no way we could know exactly who. I think it would have been a relatively wealthy man because this is made of silver and it would be more expensive than just having a leather or or cloth purse. So I guess we've, well, we've answered most of our questions, but as always, questions remain. We can't know everything about them. And that's part of the great thing about the historical value of any of these objects. We can return to them, ask the question again, and maybe delve a little deeper, learn something else. Not always just about the object, but rather about the wider time period and the sorts of people that were around. And I think usually we're getting closer to the more common folks. Too often when you go into a museum or you see a documentary, they're talking about the really unusual things, the princes and princesses. We're not really getting there. We're getting more into the things that everyday people would have. Lots of people smoked. They would get these cigarette cards. Lots of people had to carry their money. And maybe this one's a little bit higher end, but it's certainly not gold. And I like trying to figure out how did people really live, not just how did the elite live in the past. So we've talked about interactions between East and West and manipulations there. Sometimes we overturn a rock and we find something, uh, the seedier side um, of yeah. promotion of smoking or of manipulation of powers. But that's part of the history. Yeah, that's why it's so complex and interesting. Right. But that's about all the time we have for this episode. I'm Brad Hafford. And I'm Tom Petrick. Join us the next time on Artifactually Speaking. Until soon. 